Hello and welcome to this massive open online course, Introduction to Bio Risk Management. In this course, I will be teaching you about the different aspects of bio risk management. Now, when we look at bio risk management, we think in terms of both biosafety and biosecurity. And what exactly is the difference between biosafety and biosecurity? I will give you an example. For instance, biosafety management focuses on the unintentional release of a biological agent. For instance, if I am a researcher working in the lab, following all protocols, and there is a mistake for what we call a breach of containment of that particular biological agent, this is an unintended release. There is no prior motive for this release. And this falls in the domain of biosafety. Now let us look at what biosecurity involves. In biosecurity management, we don't look at the biological agent in terms of its biological activity. Rather, we look at it in terms of its threat to the environment or to society. So in this case, the biological agent is referred to as a asset or a biological asset and an asset can be used for nefarious purposes by organizations or individuals who may want to use the biological asset as a threat. So this falls in a different category in which there is a prior motive for the release of that particular biological agent. Now, having clarified the concepts of biosafety and biosecurity, let us look at how these threats can be addressed. Both of these threats are addressed using a specific management strategy. Now, in all laboratory management strategies, we follow a cyclical approach. So, we have a plan, we have a do, we have a check, and we have an act. So it's called the PDCA and it follows a cyclical procedure. And in accordance with GLPs or good laboratory practices, we always do what we write and we write what we do. So these form the tenet of biosafety management or in other words, good laboratory management. Now, for the purpose of biorisk management, PDCA has been translated into what we call as A, M, P. So A refers to risk assessment. M refers to risk mitigation. And P refers to as performance assessment. Okay, let's look at this in a practical setting. In order to work with any biological agent, be it a bacteria, a virus, a fungus, a genetically modified agent, whatever the case may be, we need to assess the risk posed by that biological agent. And this risk is measured in terms of likelihood and consequence. Now, when we do our risk assessment, we first identify the organism or what we call the biological agent, and we identify the risk associated with that biological agent. For instance, if you are working with a virus, that is spread via coughing and sneezing. It implies that the virus can be aerosolized. And if the aerosolized virus is infective to patients, the next step involves identifying what exactly happens to that patient? What is the root of infection? For instance, if the virus is aerosolized by sneezing and the patient ingests the virus, the next step will be by asking yourself, is this biological agent going to cause morbidity, which will lead to mortality? Okay, assuming that the biological agent can cause morbidity. The next step will be to ask, 
is a therapeutic measure available to address the issue of morbidity. If it's going to cause mortality, you ask yourself again, do we have the pertinent measures to limit mortality and morbidity? Now, risk is based on this entire gamut of information which you can get when you work with a biological agent. To make it more comprehensive, the World Health Organization has divided biological agents or classified them into risk groups. We have risk group 1, risk group 2, risk group 3 and risk group 4 based on the precedence or the more higher level of lethality to human hosts. Okay, having said that, the process of handling the biological agent adds to the level of risk. Let me give you an example. You are working with a virus in the laboratory. Now, when you are working with a virus in the laboratory, you may want to culture or grow this virus. Then you may want to centrifuge this virus to extract the genetic material. Or you may want to genetically modify this virus. These are basically processes. And each process has a risk associated with that. Now, for example, if you culture the virus, you are increasing the copy number of the virus. So when you increase the copy number, obviously, if there is a spill, you will have higher consequences. When you centrifuge the virus, you may have aerosolization of the virus. And this will add to the level of risk associated with the particular virus. Now, what we address as biosafety managers is the risk associated with release of that biological agent into the environment and its impact on laboratory workers as well as the general public. Okay, let us assume that you have a virus which is aerosolized. You need to contain that virus in a specific facility. Now, I am speaking to you from a containment facility which is a biosafety level 3 laboratory. Biosafety le level 3 laboratories basically contain the virus by using what is known as an engineering control or directional airflow. In this facility, all the air is filtered in through HEPA filters or high efficiency particulate filters and the air exiting from this facility is filtered out through multiple HEPA filters as well. So this constant flow of air ensures that the virus particles if aerosolized are contained within the filter itself. This in turn protects the environment as well as the laboratory worker. Okay, having said that, let us look at how risk is actually assessed. Risk is assessed in terms of two factors, likelihood and consequence. Likelihood is basically a measure of how that particular biological agent can escape or breach containment in the laboratory. For instance, if I am moving viruses around and the transport protocol is not very good. There may be a leak or a breach of containment of the virus during transport. So if there is a breach of containment during transport, there will be consequences. These consequences can include exposure of the person carrying the virus to the biological agent and his or her subsequent mortality or morbidity. So these are factors which are critical to risk assessment. You assess based on likelihood of an accident as well as the consequences of that particular accident. So risk assessment is done in a structured manner. First, we go through the process. All the processes which are associated with the biological agent. And then we assess each process for the associated risk. And when this is done, we come out with a cumulative risk assessment. 
Okay. Now, when you have decided that your risk assessment is completed, you can then look at the residual risk. What is the risk after you apply all the containment measures? And is it viable or is it safe to work with that risk? That is what you look for in risk assessment. We now move on to risk mitigation. Uh, risk mitigation is basically the reduction of the risk posed by a biological agent by the application of pertinent con controls. We have five pertinent controls which you can remember in terms of the fingers of your hand. So you have elimination, substitution, engineering controls, administrative controls, and personal protective equipment. Five controls can be applied to address the risk posed by a biological agent. So we mitigate the risk by A is elimination, in which case you decide that the experimental procedure is too risky and you do not conduct it at all. That's elimination. The second one is substitution. You can attenuate or weaken a virus and work with it in an attenuated state or a weakened state. The third one is engineering controls. For instance, now I am in a containment facility. This is an engineering control which has been designed by engineers to contain any biological agent within this facility. This is an engineering control. The next one, number four, is the administrative control. Administrative control is primarily concerned with standard operating procedures and adherence to these procedures. And finally, we have the fifth one, is the personal protective equipment which I am wearing. Now, this is the last level at that hierarchy of controls. So, if all the other controls basically fail, I still have this personal protective equipment to protect me in the case of a breach of containment. Having said that, one has to understand that bio-risk management is based on the judicious use of these controls and they all work together with each other. For instance, you cannot have an engineering control without the requisite standard operating procedures. How do you decide? the manner in which you enter and exit the facility. You need a procedure for this. So this is listed in your biosafety manual as a standard operating procedure. Your personal protective equipment. This donning and doffing or wearing of this particular apparatus is also governed by another standard operating procedure. So everything works in synchronicity with everything else. All the standard operating procedures, the engineering controls and personal protective equipment together comprise the suite or the set of biosafety measures or bio-risk management measures which we apply to mitigate the risk of exposure to the biological agent. Okay, now we move on to performance. You have assessed the risk, you have applied the controls, but you want to identify any kind of mistakes in this process. This is where performance assessment comes into play. During performance assessment, an audit of the procedures is conducted and a bench audit can identify many of the procedures which may be cumbersome and which may pose a risk to the laboratory user or to the environment. Let us look at a basic procedure. For instance, I have written a standard operating procedure for donning and doffing this particular PPE. But when the laboratory user enters the room for changing, he does not have the correct size of gloves. So he uses a glove which is of 
a larger size or a smaller size. And when he enters the laboratory, the glove tears. So the laboratory worker reports this. He says that, oh, I went to the change room, but I did not have the glove of the requisite size. And I wore a glove which was smaller, and it tore in the laboratory, and there was a breach of containment. Now, these records of misses or near misses are very important in performance assessment. The biosafety officer plays a critical role in observing the behavior of the laboratory users and in identifying the possible reasons for the breach in containment. Performance assessment adds to the entire AMP cycle. So, identification of faults during performance assessment can be applied to improve the procedures and practices in a biosafety facility. This is basically an informal introduction to what we will be discussing during our MOOC. I have tried to address certain issues like bio-risk management in terms of AMP in order to give you an overview of the entire process. I hope that you can participate in our MOOC on introduction to bio-risk management as this will enable you to be prepared for any future pandemics which may arise due to the increase in the number of incidents and accidents at the global level. I have tried to incorporate elements in this MOOC which will be of pertinence to administrators, to the biosafety officers, to the facility managers as well as to the laboratory users. Certain elements of this course can also be incorporated when you design your own facility, such as the engineering controls as well as the directional controls. If you have any questions regarding this MOOC, please post these in the comments section below. I have developed a specific set of instructions which will be given to you as slides during this MOOC. Thank you very much for watching this video. I wish you a very pleasant learning experience and above all, stay bio safe. Thank you very much.